Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, chair of the board, and we're about to get started. The first item on the agenda is the executive director's report, Susan Barrett. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few announcements. Uh, first, I wanted to let the, folk, the public know that um, board staff uh, gave a presentation on the 2021 legislative session, both to our primary care advisory group and our general advisory group. Um, and we focused on the items that were rela related to the Green Mountain Care Board's work. Those slides can be found under today's board meeting um, agenda and materials. And they're also posted on the uh, primary care advisory group and the general advisory committee sections of our website if folks are interested in looking at those. The second um, update and announcement is that tonight we'll be meeting with our primary care advisory group. They're going to be hearing from consultants from DIVA uh, and the group is going to be asked to provide feedback on uh, DIVA's HIT, HIE strategic plan. And then lastly, uh, uh, public comment, ongoing public comment session, uh, uh, sessions that are happening right now are one, the ACO budget guidance, which will be announced by our staff today. It will start today and I'll let them give you the details on when that will end in enough time for obviously the board to um, consider those comments. We also have our QHP rate filings uh, that are open for public comment. And then last but not least, as I've mentioned in previous meetings, we have an ongoing public comment period on a potential next agreement with the federal government that uh, that that those uh, slides that were presented to our general advisory um, can be accessed through our website and any of the comments we receive we're sharing with the director of health care reform at AHS and the governor's office as they're leading the way on the negotiations and that is all I have to announce back to you Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, June 2nd. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, June 2nd, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show the minutes were approved unanimously. So next on the agenda, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Kensler, who is going to tee up the vital quarterly budget presentation. Sarah. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is Sarah Kinsler, GMCB Director of Health Systems Policy, and I'm here to introduce uh, the Vermont Information Technology Leaders or VITAL um, quarterly update as well as their annual budget presentation. Um, the board is required to annually review VITAL's budget uh, per the budget guidance we approved uh, or that the board approved on April 14th. The board's review is focused on the following criteria. First, transparency. Uh, second, public and stakeholder input. Third, alignment with the goals of the HIE plan. And fourth, alignment with um, the, the process that VITAL and DIVA or the Agency of Human Services undergo in their contracting. Uh, in terms of process, today we'll hear from VITAL. Uh, adding to the list that Susan mentioned earlier, there will be a public comment period open until June 18th on the GMCB website, and we'd welcome any comment on that. Uh, and then I will be back in front of the board on June 23rd to present a staff recommendation with a potential vote also scheduled for that day. Uh, are there any questions from the board before I hand it over to Vital? There don't appear to be any, Sarah. All right, welcome Vital. Thank you. Um, I am Beth Anderson. I'm the CEO at Vital and I will get us kicked off. Um, what I'll do is I'm going to tell you who from the team is on the call today to present, but then they will each introduce themselves as we get to their sections just to avoid the awkward who goes next. Um, so today we have, I think in order of the way you will see them, um, Bob Turnell, our CFO. Um, then you will have Carolyn Stone, who is our Director of Operations, Warren Gilbert, who's our Director of Client Engagement, um, Frank Harris, who is our Strategic Technology Advisor, and Joshua Cheney is also on um, with for assistance. And so as Sarah presented, 
or the primary focus of our presentation today is to go through our proposed um, FY22 budget with you. But we also want to give some updates on how the current year is going, um, some key initiatives, um, security across the VHI, and then we'll present our quarterly um, data to you as well. Um, so just to kick off, Joshua, if you would go two slides, please. Yeah, no, one more. Thanks. Perfect. Um, you know, what, what I want to do is start with the foundation of what FY21 has looked like and how we think we'll end the year and some of our key achievements. Um, so some of the, the main things I will hit on some of the high points, you'll hear about some of these from the team as we go through the rest of the presentation. Some of the things we've accomplished th this year were um, continuing our support for the Department of Health and their COVID response work. Carolyn will give you some more detail about what that has looked like a little bit later. Um, we continue our implementation of the MedicaSoft platform. Key deliverable was reached in April, and that was the delivery of the first blueprint extract from the new platform, um, which was a great achievement for the team. Maureen will talk a little bit about and has led some planning for the collection and sharing of um, part two and sensitive data. Um, we've worked to ensure our compliance with the new um, the 21st Century Cures Act final rule and the interoperability requirements. And we've also worked with many of our providers and healthcare organizations to help them also be sure that they're in compliance with those new regulations and how they impact them. Um, we assisted one of our key partners and uh, some of their partners with data needs during a cyber attack. We've created plans, policies, and procedures to use the VHI during emergencies. Um, we've continued ongoing efforts to maintain the security and availability of the VHI, and we have initiated the strategic planning process, which um, we are doing to be aligned with the HIE plan, look at vitals, goals, and directions for the next three to five years with a goal of having that done um, in the coming months, and we can follow up with more information on that as that work is completed. Um, so, Joshua, next slide, please. So before we get into what the next uh, fiscal year or contract year will look at look like, I want to also talk about some changes we're making to the current year's contract um, in, com in conversations with Diva. Um, and really, these are changes are driven by um, a couple of, of reasons that I'll go over. Um, one being there's a renewed focus on getting claims into the VHI, a quick, um, maybe at a slightly accelerated pace from what we had originally anticipated with the contract. So we're going to uh, expand the scope. Originally it was just Medicaid claims, but we'll be taking, uh, we're trying to work with some of the private payers to get claims in the VHI. Um, so, th so the goal is to prioritize that over some of the other work. We also, um, as you've heard us say before, had some delays in the MedicaSoft project, both due to um, our focus on the COVID needs for Department of Health and also just lessons that we've learned as we've worked with this new vendor for implementation of their platform and better ways to prioritize and, and, and line up the work. Um, so what, what we're doing is, um, as I said, for 21, we're expanding the work that we'll do for claims and then linking the clinical and claims data together. And we're going to push off implementation of a few pieces of the platform until 2022. And the key things that will change are um, launch of the APIs, the, um, the patient facing access to their data for apps to get access to their data. So that doesn't mean we won't be giving patients their data as we've always done, but it'll be a new way for them to get their data, um, as well as the upgrade of the platform to the latest Fire version. Um, so with that, um, brings us then to what we think our 22 contract will look like. And as you all know from going through this many times with us is um, at this point, this is an anticipated contract scope for 2022. Um, Diva has to submit a request to CMS to get final approval for scope and the final negotiations will happen in the fall, potentially early winter. So this is kind of our best guess and what we're hoping to, what we're proposing to CMS to be the, the scope for next year. Um, and so, as I mentioned, a few things kind of shifting from 21, the upgrade to Fire R4, launching the patient APIs. We really want to um, focus on enhancing and expanding the, the reporting infrastructure that we'll, we will put in place to allow for more customized reporting and hopefully self-service reporting ultimately on the clinical and potentially claims data. Um, we will be enhancing a provider portal, which we will be piloting this year, which will really provide um, some great new functionality, we believe, to providers to make the data really more usable and actionable at the point of care. Um, we're going to be looking to transition to a new results delivery platform or tool to get the results into the EHRs for providers. 
Um, we are going to continue our work with Bi-State, um, which was a new work for us this year to kind of take their model of improvement and find ways to expand the work that they do with the FQHCs to, to a broader audience of healthcare organizations across Vermont. And so we'll be looking to continue the taking the planning that's happening this year and expand that out. Um, we're going to do transition to some existing reports to the new platform, not exciting, and we're going to do a proof of concept to, um, or continue a proof of concept to see if we can help achieve some HEDIS reporting from the VHI and maybe um, eliminate some of the burden on providers to do some of the data collection and submission. Um, so this is a scope of what's been proposed or will be proposed to CMS. Two pieces were also in conversations about that that um, are not included in this budget, but that we're hoping we may be able to include would be um, advancing some work on incorporating social determinants of health in the VHI, as well as continuing the work with sensitive data and putting that in the VHI. So Joshua, next slide, please. That then brings us to our FY22 budget. As you know, we budget on a fiscal year, which is a July 1 through June 30, but we do contracts with DIVA on a calendar year. So the FY22 budget is kind of a split of deliverables from the two contracts. So just to give you a sense of what, um, what serves as the foundation of the proposed budget that Bob will present in a few minutes are um, a few of these deliverables on here. So it's completing implementation of the Medicasoft platform, um, the work towards the R4 and the APIs, Work to expand the data type, the data types, that's the claims, social determinants of health, um, piloting and launching the enhanced provider portal. Um, some work more um, internally focused work we have on implementing a more sustainable business model, continuing the program that we've started or that Marine has really started since she's joined the organization of doing more outreach and engagement of our clients and really getting them involved in helping design future programs and services. Um, we will, as always, continue to focus on and enhance our security posture as the landscape changes to make sure that we have protected the data in the best ways possible. Um, and we will continue um, working with the Department of Public Health to try to find opportunities to help inform and support their work. And we were in conversations with them about some really, like, really exciting opportunities to continue that partnership beyond just their needs for the pandemic, but to the, the greater scale of their work. Finally, finally, and next slide, please. Um, just looking at the FY22 budget, um, you know, we do, we do face some challenges, and Bob will talk through more than just the ones that all hit. But I wanted to hit some of the key ones that I think will drive not just the 20 or are impacting the 22 and potentially future year budgets. One is if the last year has taught us anything, it's that we need to be ready for, to be flexible, right? Between the pandemic and a cyber attack, lessons learned with a new vendor. We've, we've had to be flexible to shift our work and focus on what the right priorities were at the time, even if it isn't what we thought the prior spring that the priorities would be. And we want to continue to be able to remain responsive to needs of public health and, our, and the healthcare community. Um, a big change, which I'm sure you're all aware of, is that on September 30th, the high tech funding um, sunsets. And so that was a 10 year funding that was provided under the ARA. Um, program 10 years ago to help um, encourage the use of technology in healthcare and in healthcare organizations. And so that with that sunset, um, CMS is going to continue funding of HIE work, but we're expecting it to be at much lower allocation level. So the state match won't kind of be leveraged quite as far as it has been um, or is currently being leveraged. So while the ELC, there's not a big impact to that, there, there is an impact to that with our 22 budget, but then really as you look at our CY22 contract and future years, we're expecting a, a larger impact there. The unfortunate part is at this point, we don't know what the new allocation levels are. So you'll see this budget was developed, or this 22 budget was developed with um, a perspective on what we think the kind of likely, realistic, likely case of funding could be, you know, DIVA is submitting a request that includes different scenarios where they think there's a, a strong justification for different allocation levels, but we've tried to be realistic with what we think is the most likely allocation um, rate that CMS um, will come up with, but we will keep you updated as we learn more from that those conversations. Um, um, but that then leads to kind of the additional challenge we have is with the funding from CMS changing to continue the 
the work of the HIE to deliver value to providers and payers and, and, and the ecosystem is we will likely be looking to, or we're, we're looking to develop a sustainability model that likely includes charging for some of our services in future years. So that, that does not play into the FY22 budget at all, except we're doing some planning now for what that will look like in future. And we're working with some experts to do some work there really to understand best practices at other HIEs understand what some of the kind of needs and goals and gaps are here within our community. And we're doing that in concert with some of our, our providers to get some of their feedback and really to lay out um, what we think is a kind of an achievable, sustainable model for the ecosystem as a whole and not just vital. You know, we will, again, this is something that we have underway. We'll be coming back to you to talk about that as we clarify some of what our opportunities are, as well as once we really understand where the funding is shifting and what that looks like and how it's going to impact us over the next couple of years. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions or let Bob dig into the budget numbers for you. Does anyone have any questions for Beth? I have a couple of questions. This is Robin. Um, thanks, Beth, for the um, the more detail around the fees and the timing of when you're expecting. I personally, that's an area that I'd be very interested in getting updates as you come back with quarterly information, just so that we have an understanding of where you are in the process and um, how that will impact the entities in particular that we regulate, as well as, of course, uh, other types of providers. Uh, and then the other area that I'm very interested to hear more about in the future is the claims and clinical integration. Um, I and if maybe you have this for later in the presentation, but can you give us an update on how that's going with Medicaid claims? And um, then I was curious to know, you mentioned working with payers. How does VCures fit into that? That's a great question. So Carolyn will touch a little bit on claims later. So I, 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 I'm not going to steal her thunder, but if you have additional right. questions, then great. Um, when it comes to VCures, um, so some of this work is actually being driven, much of this work is being driven by the HIE steering committee or really a subcommittee on claims that, um, so you know that Sarah Outlinberg does sit on. So she is part of these conversations. So so I, we're trying, we don't want anything to be a surprise for anyone. Um, I think at this point, it's it's really looking more to meet some more needs with um, Medicaid and some of the reporting that they want to be able to do and see like a proof of concept. Can we get the data in? Can we get it from the pairs in a usable format? And can we do the linkages of claims and clinical? Um, I, I, as far as where we go toward the future, you know, with Sarah, we've been, um, we started actually today, but looking to set up some conversations with some HIEs that do provide both APCD and the, the traditional HIE services, so to speak, to see what those models look like and if there's opportunities for us in the future. Uh, but it, right now, it's just kind of learning and exploring. Okay, great. Did that Thank answer? Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Any other board Any members other board have board questions board. for Beth? Yeah, I have a couple of quick ones. Um, <clears throat> I'm just wondering for fiscal years or calendar years 2020 and 2021, uh, there clearly was a lot of fast moving decisions that had to be made and um, and uh, and you've done a great job. It, it's, uh, you know, to go on the, uh, the, the you know, the uh, the website at the uh, at the uh, Department of Health and be able to kind of track your uh, your schedule and stuff relative to vaccinations and stuff. It was really, really done from my perspective seamlessly. But I'm wondering if if the contracts that supported all that unexpected COVID work have all been amended and adjusted so that uh, 20, uh, 2020 and 2021 are in uh, a firm position uh, to uh, proceed with your 2022 contract. Yes, so we are still, we've, um, the 20 contract, we were able to work through all of the changes. Oh, and I, I do want to give credit, like DIVA and the Department of Health, AHS as a whole, they have been very supportive of our They've made it, they've, you know, we kind of undertook the work with them with hopes that we would work it all out. And they've been great partners in making that all work. And so I do want to acknowledge that they've been great partners to us. We were able to work through it with um, the 20, the, the calendar year 20 contract and funding. And they were actually able to use some of the CRF funding that I'm sorry, the, 
the relief funding that was received by the state to help fund some of the work, um, which preserved some of the, the HIT fund monies. Um, we are we have agreed in concept to the changes to the CY21 contract, but we still have to actually formalize those changes. I, I don't anticipate we'll have any issues. It's more just the, the documentation piece of it. And I think we're in good shape for um, for 22. I, you know, I, I think we've tried to leave some, I'll call it wiggle room in the contracts to be able to be responsive where new needs might come up. But if we find ourselves in a place where we were, like, I mean, hopefully we don't, but if we find ourselves in a place where it's a much bigger ask, more like we were at last March or April, we may have to look at changing contracts again, mm -hmm. because that will, that, you know, it will impact our ability to deliver on what's in the contracts if we have to refocus in that intensive way. Um, another question is, uh, you referenced that on, on my slides are like out of sync now because the, of the addition of a new slide, but I, I think I can get my point across. You referenced on slide four, which I think is in the same place it originally was, the cost of the cyber attack. Um, and I'm just wondering, do you know what the cost of uh, attending to the unexpected demands of the cyber attack were and whether or not any of that was reimbursable? Um, we we didn't do a formal accounting of that. It was a lot of overtime for staff, largely. Um, what that what that turned into for us to be able to do the creation of the accounts and trainings uh, all hours of the of the day to meet their shift. Um, it's something that we did not because we were not ready to do that. That wasn't kind of a planned service that we had. We did not seek to ask for reimbursement for UVM. Um, what we what we are looking to do, though, is kind of develop that more as a service with some more, more clear guidelines for what that could look like if we were to provide that service for other hospitals in the future and to give them a heads up that this would be the case and not just surprise them in the end. You know, I, I mean, I don't mean to minimize it. It, it was it. I mean, it took work and responsiveness on our, our, on our team side. We were happy to do it. Um, I don't think the cost would be at all prohibitive for anyone. Like, like I said, it's really staff time that that results into on the overtime. Mm -hmm. Thank it. you. Other questions of Beth? Hearing none, why don't we go right to Bob on, in the finances? Thank you, Chair, Chairman Mullen. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Bob Trineau, CFO for VITAL, and I will be presenting our FY22 uh, budget request. Um, while last year's budget submission focused on the uncertainty introduced into our planning due to the COVID pandemic, I'm, I'm heartened that while our plan changed during the course of the year, we were able to support the state of Vermont in its COVID response. And we appreciate, to Beth's point, we appreciate the state's flexibility in modifying our deliverables on our CY20 contract to enable us to do this. This year's budget was shaped through a collaborative effort with the Green Mountain Care Board staff to draft the budget guidance necessary to support the Green Mountain Care Board's deliberative process and discussions. Um, the work scope, and funding was worked out with um, our counterparts on the DIVA staff. And we believe this has led to a more focused budget process that is linked to the plans of the state and the HIE steering committee. So thank you to Sarah Kinsler of the Green Mountain Care Board for her help, and also to Emily Richards and Bashir Ben Said from DIVA for their help as well. Okay, before we dive into the FY22 budget, um, I will just give a cursory review of where we think we will end FY21. Um, as Beth mentioned, we projected shifting funds from within the CY21 contract to meet new requirements sought by the state. This is expected to reduce the overall revenue by for FY21 by $912,000. Final sensing, and I'm just wondering um, what the process is. Um, okay. We have some interference coming through. Maybe people that aren't speaking could mute their line. Thank you, Chair Mullen. Um, in addition, we reviewed expenses and have reduced them by $833,000 as work shifts into FY22. 
Lastly, we expect that we will be in a surplus position at the end of the year with $339,000 and sufficient cash on hand of 4.5 million or 195 days. Next slide, please. Our budget for FY22 is based on the following assumptions. While we have developed our estimates on significant discussions with our DIVA partners, as Beth mentioned, there could always be an unforeseen change to the CY22 contract, given that these are estimates prepared prior to the approval of the state's funding request by the federal government and our final agreement on work scope and funds, which is projected to occur uh, later on this year. Next slide, please. This chart is intended to show the magnitude of our contracts, including those that are yet to be settled. FY21 is shown as an estimate because there's still administrative work to finalize the work scope and a contract amendment um, with DIVA. We don't anticipate this is uh, much of a rigorous effort, but um, it still is an item that needs to be completed. CY22 is estimated as it is in process. Um, we expect that it will be finalized in the early part of the fourth quarter of 2021. And as you can see, since CY20, the F the DIVA contracts have been significantly larger than prior years, showing the investment the state is putting into the VHI. I will point out that the estimate for CY22 reflects a shift in work scope from development to operations as well. Josh, next slide, please. Moving on to Revenue, as Beth mentioned in her overview, the FY22 budget has been shaped by the changes to the CY21 contract, where funds have been reallocated to expand the claims work scope and to perform preparatory work and planning for C some CY22 deliverables, primarily the transition to R4 with the database and also the launch of the patient APIs. CY22 includes a larger uh, amount for M&O, as I just mentioned. We feel that it more accurately reflects the cost of maintaining and securing the VHI, including the additional services implemented as a result of the collaborative services projects and the addition of claims. And just as a note, the um, all other that is included in this table includes fees for services such as vital direct patient ping the adt feed and the new route notification fees that we envision um, happening next slide please this chart shows the magnitude of contracts that make up vitals fy22 revenue estimate on the right hand side um, I'm trying to show here whether the contract is settled or or um, contracted or whether it is estimated to project the degree of risk of our financial uh, projections. With a contract that has been awarded, the risk in, in realizing revenue is centered on the execution, whereas with um, an item that we have estimated. There is also the added risk of the level of funding that will be available to us at the time we actually execute the contract. We've also um, included, similar to last year, a revenue contingency, although this year that value is less than 2%. Next slide, Josh. Moving on to expenses, this slide shows three years of expenses for VITAL and includes the FY20 audited results as well as the updated budget that we did in January and a forecast for year end with the FY22 budget request for comparison. Significant areas of expense for us 
is labor, which is 33% of the total spend in our budget. Now, this is down from the year-end forecast where it was 39% and significantly down from FY20 where it was 46%. This is driven by the fact that while we have modestly increased our labor, um, the other costs such as software and consulting have grown significantly. And I'll touch on those in a moment. Our labor staffing is again projected to grow modestly from a projected 26.4 FTEs at the end of this year to 28.5 at year end FY22. And, and this is consistent with the labor staffing that we had projected in our FY21 updated budget back in January. The legacy V high hosting cost is 10% of our total spend for FY22. It's essentially consistent with what we anticipate spending for FY21. Moving on to information technology cost, these are projected to be 27% of our spend. The primary drivers here are software licensing cost contained within um, this budget line item is almost a full year of subscription cost for our new data platform. In addition, there are increases to storage costs, an additional reporting function functionality that's going to be added, along with um, additional enhanced uh, security capabilities in light of the continued cyber attacks on other healthcare organizations. Our consulting costs are a major driver, 22% of our total spend. Um, we continue to use consultants or contract labor to ensure resource and subject matter expertise required to be delivered on our ongoing projects and new projects, including the aggregation of claims data and, and fire expertise. The bottom line for FY22 is essentially a break-even budget when CapEx is included. Um, next slide, please. Another way to, to look at this um, is this pie chart, which gives you um, a view of the magnitude of the expenses and their proportion to our total cost. And, and as you can see, the largest, largest component of our total cost is labor along with information technology um, next. And the IT costs cover data security, network expenses, and software um, expenses. Again, the next largest category is consulting. And the, the spend here has increased to support the increased workload that we envision for FY22, including such items as completing the Medicaid I mean, the Medica soft platform, as well as the Fire R4 transition and the APIs that Beth had talked about. Also, um, we envision um, expanded uh, data types such as claims and um, social determinants of health will also be um, some of the work that consultants will be doing along with the launch of an enhanced provider portal and um, our continued um, outreach and client engagement work that Maureen um, is doing with her team. And finally, the development um, of a sustainable business model um, are items that we see consulting will be supporting us with. Next slide, please. This is um, this org chart is our current org chart. There are uh, two open positions, Director of Technology right now and Education Outreach Specialist. Both of these positions are being actively recruited for. Next slide, Josh, please. We have been focused on maintaining a stable headcount over the past several years and, and have only added positions to take on additional work scope that we see is long term. Therefore, we use consultants to fill the short term needs when when appropriate. Vital is a lean organization focused on meeting uh, our stakeholder requirements. However, 
in some areas were one deep in our positions. The org chart that you saw um, for FY21 included two open positions. The FY22 budget adds two new full-time equivalents, um, two operations analysts supporting the claims expansion and interfaces, along with a half-time financial support position. In addition, the FY22 budget includes um, temporary staffing that uh, we had brought on um, as part of our FY21 budget update. Next slide, Josh, please. The FY22 budget uh, assumes that the additional FDEs that um, we're bringing on will all start in July, except for uh, the claims analyst, which, which will start as part of the CY22 contract in January. Um, one note is that the temporary labor that um, is reflected in FY21 is just a partial year, while FY22 is a, a more complete year. Moving on to our, our benefits, we don't see a significant change to our benefit plans. Um, our plans expire 12-31-2021, so they are calendar year basis. So um, the rates are essentially fixed for the first half of the year. Now, we do realize that there is uh, some risk potentially um, in terms of rates, but we believe that it is manageable. Next slide, Josh. Moving on um, to indirect rates, this, this bar chart shows vitals um, indirect rates over four years. The bars have four pieces. Um, the top two uh, reflect direct cost or those costs that can be assignable directly to supporting the program, whereas the bottom two represent indirect or general business or entity level uh, costs. As you can see, the line has grown somewhat over the year over the four year period, but not at the same rate as our direct expenses. Vital has worked hard to keep indirect cost in check over the past three years. And you can see with the addition of the collaborative services and future data platform projects that we have added significant direct cost to Vital, well, at which in turn reduces the indirect rate um, and finally, as such a small organization changes in either the base, which is the direct cost or the expense, the indirect cost can have a large impact on, on the rate. Next chart, Josh. This chart just displays Vitals assets by category over the periods of FY20. FY21, both the updated budget from January and our latest look at year end and the FY22 budget request with the intention to show Vitals financial resources that are available to us during the projected FY22 budget period. The majority of our assets are quick assets such as cash on hand and accounts receivable that are highly liquid. Our current forecast for the year end for FY21 is $4.5 million of cash on hand or 195 days. This easily covers the projected liabilities of 1.6 million. The budget for FY22 projects cash at the end of the year to be 5.2 million or 172 days. This again easily covers the projected liabilities of 2.5 million. In conclusion, we believe that this budget positions vital to continue to execute on its contractual requirements and the mission of using health information technology to improve the quality of care, to enhance patient safety, and to reduce the cost to deliver care. And that concludes my presentation. Do you want to field questions, Bob, or do you want us to keep going? Um, sure. I. I We'll be glad to field questions. Okay, board members, questions for Bob? 
Um, I, yeah, I have a couple. It's Maureen. Um, I guess uh, first, uh, can you talk a little bit about what the CapEx uh, is for this year? I think you have like 430000 and I know you were under, I'm sorry, for 22, and I know you underspent in 21. So is some of that just moving to the next year? That's correct. Um, essentially what that is, the bulk is the implementation costs on our uh, Medicasoft um, new data platform. Now, in we are evaluating with our um, audit auditors uh, um, whether this is um, truly an expense item or whether it it will be a, a capitalizable item. That's why I put it as a, as an item for the board's um, consideration um, on the statement of activities. Okay, and then, um, you know, as you mentioned, the consultant expenses continue to increase, and I think they're up almost a million dollars from prior year. And I know I had asked this before, but are there any opportunities to bring people in on staff um, to do some of that, which might be less costly than consultants, um, you know, and then you then you have that expertise, you know, on staff. I know I know it's hard to hire and everything, but since you keep continuing to increase that number, it seems like there may be some efficiency there somewhere. Bob, do you want me to take that one? Yeah, Beth, please. Um, you know, it's a great question that we keep looking at. Um, we and. Um, you can see some of the shift for 21 to 22. We are looking to hire some of the expertise that we know we need. So one of the positions we're looking to hire is a claims expert, right? Now that we're going to have claims in the database, we don't want to contract for something we know we're going to need long term. But a lot of the the consulting the, the, the consulting that we have in the budget largely is um, staff that we won't need long term. So it's really to help get the implementation done. So either where we needed expertise or we just need more hands doing some of the work during the implementation, which really involves like documenting requirements, doing testing on the data that just doesn't continue for long term. And we don't want to set up a lot of hiring for, for long term hire. I will say there is um, kind of one group within consulting or one position within consulting that I think we are going to we will be looking at this year to see um, if we have a long-term need for it, for kind of transitioning that into an actual FTE. Um, but but we have I, we we have paid attention to that. I, I do understand and appreciate your your point that we don't want to be paying extra money where we don't need to be paying extra money. We also don't want to be hiring people for one 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 and a half years and setting up expectations for recruiting and what that looks like. Okay, great. And Wait, just, well, I just want to just, compliment you on your slides um, there, Bob, and the financials. They're very clear, so that's great. Thanks. Thank you. Maureen, can I just follow up on that quickly for a second? Um, Beth, just you had mentioned short-term and long-term. Can you just describe to me what, what long-term means to you and short-term means to you in terms of the consulting? Like, are you expecting sure. the consulting component of the budget for 23 to go down, or is it going to be 24 yeah. when it goes down? Uh, I would expect it to go down. So some some of the some of the change you'll see is um, some of it is getting through this implementation and getting the work done. Some of it has been shifts in what our needs are too. So even though the number has been a little consistent, it's been shifts in what what some of the expertise we need within there is too. So I would say we we would look at. Um, I don't, we don't have a hard and fast rule. I'm not going to try to represent that we do, but I think we would try to look at if this is you know some that we know we're going to go live in. February next year, and we will not need that role. We wouldn't want to hire that person. If we're looking at, look, we're going to be doing claims work for the next three or four years. That's where we would we would look differently to hire. Um, and we have and we do have some people that we have hired as we're, we're, we call temporary employees. So knowing it was more than a six month gig, but we not a permanent position. So we 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 do have some of that already in place, and we we look to do that also. Great, thank you. Okay, hey, Tom, I think you were trying to say something. Yep, um, quick, two quick questions. Um, one is I, uh, you know, I hear you have your kind of profile of assets and uh, on your submission, you also had a profile of um, unrestricted net assets. And I uh, went back and got, got the number from uh, FY19 just to kind of get a longer view. And uh, so it is uh, your unrestricted net assets um, in 19 to 20 went from 
3.5 million to 4.2 million, 21 forecast over 20 from 4.2 to 4.6 million, and uh, 22 budget, 5 million over 4.6 million. And I'm just wondering, in terms of your sustainability model, I, I'm I'm never, you know, I'm never going to have a problem with someone squirreling away money. But I'm just trying, in terms of your your sustainability modeling, how do these these numbers fit? Uh, I just note that um, your projected uh, um, unrestricted net assets for 2022 is a uh, 45.5% of your projected expenses. Um, so I guess I have two questions is how does this fit into a, your emerging concepts of a sustainability model? And since most of this money is coming from DIVA, do they have any discussions with you about your unrestricted assets? Do you want me to take that one too, Bob? Sure. Or do you, I mean, if you want to answer it. I'm well, um, the the buildup of unrestricted net assets is is basically the culmination of um, the um, you know essentially net income each year and you know yes we have a projected um, surplus um, but as Beth has mentioned, um, we anticipate that um, in future years that state funding is going to be um, less than than what it is today. And um, that um, unrestricted assets really represent in some ways um, mm -hmm. one component of our sustainability for um, out years. You know, obviously the other part of that would be alternative um, revenue sources, but I, I foresee that um, at some point, you know, we will need those funds to be able to sustain us through a potential lean year. Well, I think that's uh, right. Go ahead. Can I just do you mind if I just add to that? I, I think that's right. I think to, to more specific to one of your more specific questions, this is definitely part of what we're looking at when we think about kind of a revenue model and what that looks like. I think we're trying to be really careful to be sure that um, where we develop kind of fees that we are being true to what things are really costing and charging for what they're really costing. Not like, you know, we're not looking to make a significant profit off of this. We are a nonprofit and that is our intent. So we want to be careful around that. I also think we're going to look to potentially leverage some of these monies, as Bob mentioned, to kind of help us make that shift to the new model. And also we're look to see where we could potentially invest some of these monies in some tools that would be value added to us for for our customers and help kind of support their needs and their work. So it's definitely, we're definitely looking at how we um, can use some of those funds to develop that model looking forward. So one quick follow-up. Um, so where does, I mean, if you go back to an earlier slide, you can really see the, the growth in total state contracts, you know, quite an accelerated growth. And, and certainly there may be risk that DIVA can't do going forward what they've been able to do uh, in the rearview mirror. But um, so where does DIVA get the money for your contracts? Is it um, global commitment money or general fund money? Do, do, you, do you have any insight into that? Yeah, so our understanding is traditionally it has been um, HIT funds monies that which then are used as the match for the CMS funds and the the which have been very generous match rates um, traditionally for our monies. Looking into the next year, I think it's going to be a mix of different sources, and Diva's still working out what some of those might look like. Um, but there's a potential for it could be some of the, the 1115 and global commitment monies for a small portion of our work. Um, but that is still, that is not, as, as nothing is for CY22, that is not a final look. Thank you. Okay, other questions or comments from the board? I, 
just had a follow up to um, that last discussion, and I know that under the high tech dollars, it's often a 90 10 match. Are you do you have a particular match rate that you're assuming in your budget buildup, or you're just kind of ballparking dollars? Um, we working with um, our counterparts at Diva. Um, I know that they have um, put forth a number of different. Um, alternative funding um, schema, if you will, with uh, CMS. Um, mm -hmm. And each of those schemas really has um, a different um, funding rate for them. Um, yeah. And what we assumed, um, it was based on a Medicaid population uh, based uh, formula. Um, which um, we believe kind of is the worst possible case because um, originally, Beth, correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, originally um, that funding was based on more of a provider-based value rather than a population-based value. Yeah, there there are two components that go into the um, st stop me from saying what, what the board already knows. There are two components that go into the calculation. One is that allocation, which Bob is correct. Right? Currently, it, until September, it is based on the percent of providers that are Medicaid providers, and it go what kind of we're assuming is worst case is it goes to the percent of the population that's Medicaid on Medicaid, right? So that goes from about a, a rounding, but about a 96 to about a 32%. Then CMS will also will still be offering um, a level of match, which will be the more traditional numbers you use to the 25, 90, but it's based on that allocation. So that's really where things are, are significantly shifting is at 96 to what we're thinking is around 32, 33%. Got it. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board? If not, we'll we'll proceed to the next section. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. This is Carolyn Stone. I am the director of operations for Vital, and um, I'll give you a quick update on where we are with uh, our COVID activities. Josh, if you can go, thanks. Um, so, as you know, we've been working with VDH to support the state's response. Um, one of the ways we were doing that was providing data access and reporting. Um, we've been providing the provider portal to the epidemiology team for their case reporting. That's been ongoing. We've also had an ongoing automated data feed for the daily health and human services reporting that hospitals are required to do. Um, and then a new thing that we've done since we last talked to you or presented to you would be um, we've been su we supplied data to support uh, VDH's high risk immunization registration efforts um, in helping them identify who who could be potentially on that list. Um, the other area that we really ramped up with um, over the last few months has been uh, the lab testing and immunization data interfaces. Um, since the beginning, we've onboarded 14 new labs and have, I, I want to say, over 20 more in flight right now. Um, we're working with VDH and um, to prioritize which ones are, are their top priorities and bring those on uh, as, as quick as possible. We also onboarded um, over 108 new immunization sites. Um, those were primarily focused on the major pharmacy chains in Vermont so that they could get daily reporting going to VDH. Um, and then the last area that we have been focused on is providing emergency services, medical services, the provider portal access so that they can look up patients who they'll be transporting uh, to understand their, their healthcare needs better. Um, and then, you know, we continue working with VDH to look and see how the HIE can support these public health activities um, going forward. We know that we'll probably be working with some additional immunization sites and the testing labs definitely keep coming. Um, I think we've gotten most of the big ones, but as that area seems to be evolving and new tests are coming out, it, we just keep adjusting with VDH. And, and staying in sync with them as to who the priorities are there. Um, 
questions on the COVID support? Any questions from the board on the COVID support? All right, then I'll move into the collaborative services update. Um, so we wanted to give you an update on where we are with our implementation. Uh, as Beth mentioned, we completed our first major deliverable in April, and that was delivering the clinical data extract to the Blueprint for Health. Um, that contained all of the data elements that were their priorities. Um, we've also updated our project schedule to reflect um, you know, the capabilities that we're, we're seeing and the prioritization of claims, additional claims data. Um, and then we're, this next wave is uh, scheduled to be completed by September 30th, which aligns with the end of our DIVA contract. Um, so we will be taking the full clinical database live and that just expanding on the data sets that we brought live for Blueprint. Um, we're also going to be establishing that claims database with the first production data for um, the Medicaid data, definitely, and we're hoping to get some um, other payer data in there as well. Um, and then the provider portal will be live and ready for the pilot to kick off at the end of September um, with the first few initial users so that we can get some engagement with the provider community on the pilot and um, their feedback. And then the future phases of the project will include uh, One Care Vermont reporting, um, claims reporting, platform expansion, and uh, those patient APIs that were talked about by Beth. Um, so next steps, um, we're gonna complete the remaining validation and data quality work on that full set of clinical concepts for the database. Um, and then we're going to finalize our claims requirements, create some submission guides for claims data ingestion, um, and validate the first file ingestion, which uh, at this point will be the Medicaid claims. Um, and then we're also finalizing our portal, portal requirements. Uh, we just finished that in May, and the data validation from the database to the application, the provider portal application is in flight and also the functionality that goes with that. So that's that's our report on the MedicaSoft collaborative services platform. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have on this topic. Are there any questions on the Medica, MedicaSoft uh, platform? I have a couple. Um... I was curious about the blueprint clinical data extract and sort of what the bigger picture plan is there. Um, because certainly I know from the blueprint executive committee meetings that uh, providers had gotten used to getting extracts of data related to their, their medical home practice on originally monthly. And I know that was put on hold to implement the new technology, but What's kind of the long-term plan here with the blueprint extracts? Uh, you know, we're still discussing what 2022 looks like. Um, my understanding was that blueprint had been getting these extracts and providing them to OnPoint on an annual basis. And what OnPoint was doing from there on, I can't really speak to. Um, yeah. So we provided the 2020 data to them in April so that they have all the 2020 data to do their analytics. We provide it to OnPoint and Blueprint. Um, and then the schedule has us providing another extract in January on the 2021 data, and then looking at, does this become a quarterly or does this become a view that Blueprint has access to the data themselves? You know, that, that work still needs to be defined on what what would meet their needs? Um, they're definitely changing the way they're thinking about um, working with practices and providing data as well. Um, so, so still much to be determined there, but we do plan to provide at a minimum annually, just like they had been getting from um, the clinical registry when it was uh, decommissioned. Great. And then um, you had mentioned um, some of the future work was uh, related to OneCare's reporting. Reporting to whom? 
Um, so right now we provide OneCare with uh, clinical data elements that they ingest into their health catalyst system. Yeah. And so it's to replace that work because that currently is coming out of Vitals data warehouse. And as we replace that data warehouse with the Medicasoft platform, we need to replicate that work in the new platform. Um, so they they basically take that data into their system directly from ours. And we're working through those requirements right now with them on what would that look like? Do they want the same thing? Do they want us to format it differently? Um, you know, what exactly are their requirements? We also do provide some data directly into their care quality, uh, care navigator tool. We provide some admissions, discharge, and transfer data that uh, comes out of our our Rhapsody data engine, and that won't change. So um, we plan to just continue su supporting them in the ways we are supporting them now. And you know, eventually, I would love to grow that support for them, but. Um, Right now, Thanks. it's just supporting them with data that they've requested. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions for Carolyn? Yeah, maybe just one. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the uh, the pilot for the um, provider portal and just uh, what types of providers are included in that pilot? How are they selected? How are you going to be evaluating that pilot for expansion and implementation, you know, fuller implementation? Just a little bit of that about background around that. Yeah, I mean, um, I'll take a stab at it, and Maureen can jump in. Um, she's really leading that effort. Um, we're going to be starting out with a lot of engagement to find out which types of uh, providers would like to be engaged, and and have the time to, you know, help us evaluate the new product and provide feedback, and doing some outreach with those groups. Um, we'd like to see, you know some variation in the types of people we select so that we can get a good cross-section of uh, feedback. And then, you know, clearly it'll be in it. The, the portal will be an iterative thing where we'll continue to keep working on it as we go. Um, so. Carolyn, Carolyn's spot on. Um, we have a number of folks I think of as super users who don't don't know that we call them that yet, um, but we'll be doing some reach out uh, outreach to talk to them. Um, and there's folks in that group across um, quite a variety of different roles, whether it's um, EMS or um, administrative and support professionals at a practice to clinicians. Um, really, it's there's some diversity there, and we hope to engage a, a range. And we do think that the piloting is going to take. A number of different stages. So there might be some some really early basic user acceptance testing, followed by um, a little fuller sort of beta testing of the tool. And we're going to be able to roll this out over the period of of several months, early in um, calendar year 2022. So lots of opportunities along the way for feedback. Is there will there be an opportunity to include sort of non users or little users in the sense that maybe this would entice them to be super users at some point? Um, we have been thinking about about how to get to those folks because we absolutely don't want to design a tool just for the people who use it today. Um, so I don't have an answer for you about that yet, but it's absolutely something we're thinking about. Great, thank you. Other questions from the board? If not, let's proceed. Great. So um, I'm Maureen Gilbert. I'm the Director of Client Engagement at Vital. And I'm going to provide an update about our work on consent. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about our general consent policy and how we continue to support that. Um, we have continued providing consent education to participating organizations and offering tools to healthcare organizations for their use with patients. Right now, that includes the development of a new website, and there's going to be an updated consent education toolkit there, um, something really accessible so we can, you know, with one link, point folks to all of the resources that they can use to educate their patients, whether it's in person with a brochure and a conversation or a flyer posted in their portal, social media posts that they could use in their um, broader outreach. 
We're also at this point continuing to hold on broad direct to the public education tactics while COVID response and vaccination promotion messages require full attention. This just hasn't felt like the time to be educating about the health information exchange when there is this urgent um, health care topic that requires Vermonters full attention. Next slide, please, Joshua. So sensitive data sharing consent and, and that project, we're seeing a lot of uh, changes in that project that we'd like to share with you at this point. And this is really based on federal guidance. So we had anticipated federal guidance clarifying the CARES Act changes to the 42 CFR Part 2 data sharing regulations by late March. And we were exploring some options for how we might share data that had been covered by part two, um, substance use disorder treatment data, and then the mental health care data that often rides along with that. We had been exploring some options. It was, I think, becoming quite clear that folks needed um, real choices to consider rather than theoretical choices to consider. Um, so we were anxiously awaiting the federal guidance that would make it clear what we could do here, what kind of data sharing would be possible in the future. But on April 9th, SAMHSA announced that it intended to publish those amendments later in 2021. I think um, nobody's expecting that to be soon. Later in 2021 could mean a lot of things, but I don't think anybody's anticipating seeing that before the November, December period. So with that in mind, we've chosen to, to wait for those amendments before further exploring options for the sensitive data sharing design. And that's something that we're doing for the purposes of um, maximum clarity for patients, um, clinicians, and other stakeholders, and really to minimize the burden on participating organizations who have offered us some of their time already in engaging around this topic. But we think we're going to be able to make the best use of their time when we, we know the options that are truly in front of us. But one of the other things that I learned in this sort of early engagement period where we were doing engagement across a number of different types of organizations and different types of clinicians, including general medical um, providers and also um, folks working in like, the designated agencies, people providing mental health and substance use disorder treatment. One of the things that became clear was that it, it was going to be hard for folks to really meaningfully consider the options without a richer understanding of the Vermont Health Information Exchange. And I think that was particularly true in the substance use disorder treatment and mental health treatment communities who have not been our core clients in the past. And so what I see as an opportunity while we, we wait for the federal guidance is to do more intensive education with those um, provider communities and really get them ready to, to understand the choices that, that they have regarding sensitive data sharing. And really, there's no reason they can't be using our tools right now. There certainly are some of, of providers in those communities who are using vital access, for instance, to, to get information about their patients. And we think probably more engagement with that tool will be a good way to, to understand the Vermont Health Information Exchange and its possibilities better. So that's where we're looking to focus this project for the remainder of the calendar year. And then we're really excited to hear what's coming next from the federal government and pick that back up. Any questions there? Questions for Maureen from the board? On consent? Yes, I have one question. Go ahead, Tom. Um, so I'm just wondering how things have evolved in terms of uh, the integration of consent with the potential of adding um, <clears throat> social social determinants of health to the information base, um, because that was a an aspirational idea um, a while back, but it's probably becoming closer and closer to being operational. And I'm just wondering what the current thinking is on integrating. Uh, can, uh, the access to those kinds of records uh, with, with the, the consent policy. I think it's an interesting topic for us to be thinking about at the same time as the part two consent. And I think I'm going to um, kick this one over to Beth. Um, I think some of this has to do with the way that data is shared by our partners and the uh, agreements that they make with their, their clients or members around that data. 
Yeah, I, I would agree with Maureen. I think this is something we have to spend a little more time on only because we're still defining what social determinants of health mean and what data items those are. And I, I, at this point, I don't think we can consistently say if it's social determinants of health that we collect from providers that are questions they ask, the things your provider might ask you, like, do you smoke? Do you have how many drinks do you have during a week? Or if we're looking at actual data sets from different areas, like if we were to talk to, say, corrections or economic services. And I think until we have that scope figured out, it's hard to answer what um, kind of the guidelines would be around sharing that data. But absolutely a really important question that we will have to be asking and looking at as we think about incorporating the data. So I think I'd have to ask to commit to come with more information as we better understand what the goals and, and intents are. Thank you. Other questions from the board for Maureen? If not, we will proceed to the next section. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Frank Harris. I'm the Strategic Technology Advisor for Vital, and um, with our Director of Technology uh, currently under recruitment, as Bob mentioned, I'm going to be giving you the security update today. And uh, um, I know this is an area that's gotten a lot of focus um, recently um, with what we've all been seeing in the national news, but. I'll say that um, this is an area that we continuously have an intense focus on at VITAL, and, and uh, we're going to continue to do that. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, Joshua. So these are some of the things that we've uh, been working on recently. Um, the first is in the area of identifying and analyzing risk, and I think as the board has heard in the past, um, each year we have external healthcare security experts assess our entire security program from top to bottom and, and recommend areas for improvement. And, and we did that assessment in February. And uh, just uh, last week um, went um, through a detailed review with them of the results. They do a complete program assessment, which includes um, procedures and policies, compliance and technology details. Um, and we were very pleased with our results this year. Um, what happens from there is um, each year we develop an action plan, which we call a plan of action and milestones um, that um, is based on their assessment. And we're creating that plan now. We collaborate really closely with the Agency of Digital Services on that plan. They have a security specialist assigned to our program and um, who is excellent. And um, we collaborate with her very closely. We meet with them each month uh, to review our progress against our plans and the uh, priorities, how we're prioritizing the initiatives that we're going to do, and uh, any significant decisions that need to be made about those things. So, so uh, we're going to continue with that process. Uh, in the next area that we uh, call protecting endpoints, and endpoints um, is, is uh, what we call PCs and servers. So basically, uh, you know, anything that runs uh, programs within our environment. And um, we've we've um, uh, been working on a couple of really significant uh, technology initiatives in that area. The first one is uh, application control, and that's a technology that controls all of the programs that run in our environment. So um, it locks down the entire environment and allows only pre-approved programs to run um, in our environment on our servers or on our PCs. And we've uh, installed that software. We're implementing it now. As you might imagine, it's a pretty challenging implementation because it involves uh, identifying and, and categorizing every single piece of software that runs in the environment. Um, but that's progressing well. Um, it's just gonna be a very significant uh, protection um, in the environment when we get that completed. And then the next area is around next generation anti-malware, or a lot of times people would call this uh, antivirus. Um, and um, the, uh, we have implemented that technology that's in place. And what that refers to is um, the reason it's called next generation is because um, conventional malware for years and years has really been based on identification of known threats. So a piece of malware that um, is known to be out there in the world and uh, it can recognize that and prevent that from running. But um, given what's happening in the threat landscape, um, it's it really um, important to go beyond that now. Um, in, in what next generation uh, anti-malware uh, anti does is it will um, 
raise alerts not only based on known malware, but also any unusual or suspicious activity that occurs in the environment. Because the trend that's out there now in terms of security threats is that um, hackers are leveraging legitimate tools to uh, cause damage within the environment. And so it's important to be able to recognize when there's abnormal activity happening. And so we have that in place now, and um, it's a really significant step forward. Um, and then the third area is what we called ensuring resilience. And, and um, what this refers to is that um, really what's happening given the threats um, that you know, we're seeing in the activity that we're seeing out there in the world, um, the, the industry strategy now is to look beyond preventing intrusions and to really focus a lot on the what if an intrusion occurs, um, how you can react and mitigate and recover from an intrusion. And one of the things there is that um, you know, what's really emerging and becoming increasingly important is that speed is essential. When, when um, an intrusion is detected, it's essential that you react quickly to prevent damage. And there's usually a small window of opportunity to once an intrusion is detected to prevent um, something bad from happening. And um, as we've mentioned to you before, we um, previously had implemented what, what's called a security information and event management system that collects data from throughout our environment about um, what's happening. And we have a security operation center partner that monitors that system for us 24 seven. Um, well, what we've added to that is um, with the next generation anti-malware that we implemented, we have a specialist partner that looks at um, the suspicious activity that might be um, identified by the uh, anti-malware, and they um, are um, an expert security resource that monitors that 24-7, and they are empowered to intervene into our environment to uh, stop an intrusion if that occurs. The software itself um, is, is uh, intelligent and will prevent a lot of intrusions, but um, the, it, it's immediately um, investigated by an uh, expert 24-7 um, if um, there's any suspicious activity. And we're reviewing um, uh, other opportunities for future enhancements in this area focused on the things that I mentioned about how we can react or mitigate or recover if an intrusion should occur. So that's my update for you today. I'm glad to take any questions. Questions for Franco? Any board questions on the security enhancements? Hearing none, we'll proceed to the next section. So we um, we know we're over time here and we have eight slides left where we can provide a little bit in, more information about our quarterly report. I just want to check whether you would prefer that we um, try to run through this efficiently, just skip it and just take questions. We're happy to handle this in whatever way the board prefers. I think you run through them efficiently and then we'll go to, to questions. All right. Thank we you, will Mike. aim for efficiency. Next slide, please, Joshua. So this is the um, percent of Vermont patients who have opted out of the Vermont Health Information Exchange, currently at 1.4%, a um, slow, slight decline over time here um, to be expected as we are every month adding quite a number of new users to the Health Information Exchange. I believe it's 10 to um, 15,000 new users a month, or I should say um, individual records a month. Next slide, please. So this is the queries by organization type, and you can see the distribution here of who's using the tool the most. Certainly um, hospitals are our biggest users, um, and this does include queries during the cyber attack. And we see a, a great amount of use here as well from federal and state agencies, and this includes the, the VA and DOD, as well as, as our own um, more local um, users. Next slide, please. This is the number of queries a month in vital access. You can see, of course, that very dramatic spike during the cyber attack, but I think you can also see here um, an interesting increase over time um, to about 20,000, a little over 20,000 queries a month now, which um, more than double sort of the rate about 
this time. Um, well, much more than double the rate this time last year, but um, where we were at sort of on average last year. Next slide, please. And this is queries of the Vermont Health Information Exchange via eHealth Exchange. Most of these queries are coming from the VA and DOD. Um, we did understand that they were using this, this daily in their workflows um, and that there have been some changes in their workflows recently. So we're asking some questions about that and we'll be tracking this over time. Next slide, please. Results delivery by results type. So this is the delivery of laboratory results, radiology reports, and transcribed reports directly into the electronic health records of um, the ordering clinicians. And you'll see some, some really some steadiness here, I think, is the story. And this is results delivery by organization type. So who is um, who is receiving these results on this slide? And you'll see quite a lot of use here by federally qualified health centers receiving the results from the, the hospitals and labs in the state as well as independent practices um, being big consumers of this data. Next slide, please. Um, and I will give this one to Carolyn. Hello, and you know, so Vital had a contract target of 30 interfaces and 25 public health interfaces in 2021. And um, thanks to all of the COVID work we've done, we've met both targets uh, for this work. Um, we're continuing to work with um, DIVA, Agency of Digital Services, Department of Health, and other agencies to support data needs in responding to COVID uh, during the second half. Um, and the other item that we'll also be working on is with the steering committee, the HIE steering committee, on creating the claims data connectivity criteria in conjunction with our implementation guide um, and reviewing the existing criteria to include in the HIE plan this fall. Uh, next slide. And the last area where we are reporting on to you this quarter is on meaningful use and security risk assessment consultation. And we continue to provide that service uh, this year. We are contracted for a lower amount of hours this year in our contract, which is why you'll see the hours are a little bit lower, but we're still able to respond to those who would like these services. And that concludes our report. So at this point, board, if you have any questions about any of the uh, 40 slides, go ahead. And uh, after that, we'll move to public comment. So any board members? I just had one quick question on the pie charts um, in, the, in the last segment. And I'm just wondering from you, know, you folks in the field, whether or not um, the queries by organization and the results delivered by organization type, does that reflect what you'd expect or are there areas there that um, where you think that there might be potential for growth? Uh, you're going to speak back? Okay. No, uh, please I, was gonna say, I think that there's always potential for growth in results delivery area and in the queries area. Um, you know, I think there's there's still as part of our education and outreach campaigns, we're still discovering people who don't know who the VHI is and what we can provide. So um, I think that there is growth in those areas um, that can still happen. I think the new platforms will probably be able to accelerate that in the future. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the board? If not, I'm going to open it up to the public for public comments. Does any member of the public wish to comment on the vital budget? And I see that uh, Ham Davis has his hand up. Ham? Uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, this is this going to sound like maybe an ignorant question, and I actually it is kind of an ignorant question. But I'm curious. Um, I'm curious that one of what in talking to people about the overall issue of health care reform, the whole issue of changing reimbursement from from uh, fee service to capitation, 
one of the most persistent questions. I'm not talking about health care healthcare experts. I'm talking about ordinary people who are smart but who, who don't really know anything about this. Is one of the most persistent questions is uh, if you shift to if you shift from fee for service to capitation, will you build? Uh, are you building in a, a huge incentive for underuse? Now, I myself have never really seen any underuse, and I don't. And I don't so. But at the same time, um, when people ask me that, I, they ask me if I'm if I really know if I if I'm sure am I sure of that? How do I know? And I realize that the question is, I really don't know. And I'm so I'm very curious about the extent to which this extremely esoteric stuff, um, whether the whether we're going to be able to see something about healthcare quality that is going to be accessible to the public. Uh, if it, it, the, so, you have the underuse question for people who just don't understand it very much at all. You're already on a, on a track to look at, at at potential overuse in your in your uh, sustainability stuff, but um, there used to be. I'm just I just don't see how the public engages with this. I can just guarantee you that no member of the public has got the faintest idea what this single thing has been talked about for the last hour. They're gonna just uh, nobody's gonna know any of that, and so. I just think that sooner or later we're going to have to do something here. For instance, the most basic thing is that for many years, I be, and still I believe, Medicare and puts out two hospitals, um, you know, results about Medicare quality, and it compares quality and cost across the whole system, and it puts out these little diagrams that have circles and colors, and it can be in the four different quadrants and so forth. You get a sense of that. I just think that what 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 I'm just curious about is the board happy with this? You really do you what do you do any of you get asked questions like this? What is what is the actual what does the public how does the public actually know anything about the actual productive results of the healthcare system in Vermont? Well, I think you're really directing the question to us and not to Vital, aren't you, Ham? Uh, sure. I mean, well, I, I, yes. I mean, uh, because I have no idea what the, I know. I have no idea what they're talking about. When you when you're talking, Kevin, I get it exactly. So yes, <laughs> good answer. Yes. You might be in a club of one, Ham. <laughs> no, well, you know, not really. I, well, I, anyway, that 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 that's my question. I think I think it's something the board needs to. To, to needs to consider because whatever the performance of the board is, the reality is that the that the legislature, and not just and not just the legislature, anybody who thinks, I think you heard this from um, Mike Fisher, anybody who starts thinking about this and starts saying that we really need to figure out something else here, that we really need to see, get a better look at this. The only place they have to go to is they only have the place to go to. It's the Green Mountain Care Board. That's it. There is no place else. And I would say at the Green Mountain Care Board, Ham, there are several um, really measurements. If you take a look at, uh, for example, the work that Michelle Degree does for the board on the quality measurements, uh, I think that's really important information. I think work being done um, for us now by um, two subcontractors is going to be very, very helpful information, um, not only to the public, but to the providers as well, as far as utilization. And, um, you know, that therein lies the rub of getting to um, making sure that the porridge is just right, because you don't want too much care and you don't want too little care. Yeah. And I do think that we have the tools to make sure that we can get the porridge just right. Well, I, 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 I appreciate that, Kevin. And, and uh, can I just get some technical because it's just hard to do, but can you just quickly name the two consultants? I, I like to talk, I've been calling them. I've known about them since you hired them last year. I just call them Joe and Schmo. Can you just tell me who they are quickly? Or should I get sure. it? Sure. It's, uh, Ber it's Berkeley Research Group and Burns. Hmm. Oh, Burns. Okay, thanks, Kevin. I appreciate it. Okay, more. Hi. Uh, I 
One question, one comment. The question is for, I believe, for Carolyn Stone, has to do with the Medicaid claims. I'm curious about the age of the claims that are being uh, used in this pilot. One of the supposed disadvantages of the claims is they take a year to go from raw to seasoned to mature claims that are actually paid for. But in many cases, it's it's what the what was billed for that actually happened, whether or not it ever got paid for. So I wondered what you're using in your pilot. Right now, we're discussing with Medicaid that we will use their post-adjudicated. So however long it takes them to say, we've, we've settled this, it will be. Um, that doesn't mean that we won't be able to take earlier claims in the future. It just means that that's where we're starting right off the bat. Um, right. Okay, thank you. That It's not much of an advantage over V-cures if you're waiting until these are actually adjudicated, I don't believe, although others know this better. But let me just switch to the uh, philosophical question, which is for Beth. So the, the HIE is a public good. There's no way around it. Where What... You know, there's a tension here. So what? how do you balance the tension between what's largely a public good and the need for a business model? Who's going to pay? Uh, how are you going to determine the charges? That's a great question. And that's some of what we're, we're working through now. I think you're right at its core. The We look at the data as a public good, but as the, the funding shifts, we want to be able to maintain the functionality. So what we're, what, what we're really looking at is the, some of the services we offer now, but really services that we're looking to provide in the future being more value add, saving, um, saving work, being operational efficiencies, areas where we can really add value to the organizations that use. And whether it's existing providers that we work with or potentially new partners that we have where we can add additional value to their work and 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 generate revenues in, in that way and, and with the hope that it's not for kind of those as you mentioned like the more utility foundational services what if a pharmaceutical company came to you they'd be very interested in this data that that is not where the direction that we're looking at going right we are guided by consent policy we are guided by the um the use policy that's included in the HIE plan and our service agreements that we have in place with the partners that provide the data or, or submit the data to the VHI, and we, we will kind of remain true to what those look like and kind of commercial purposes is not and, um, included in those purpose and in those agreements. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Great questions. Other members of the public, any comment on the vital budget? If not, Beth and uh, team, uh, great presentation. We learned a lot today. Um, as you heard from Sarah at the beginning, um, she'll be coming back with uh, staff recommendations. Sarah, did you want to say anything at this point in time? No, just to thank Vital for coming in and for a comprehensive presentation. Thank you. Thank you for having us and for your help, Sarah. Thank you. So now we're going to uh, pivot and transition to a discussion of the fiscal year 22 accountable care organization budget guidance. And I'm going to turn it over to Marissa Melamed and Sarah Tewksbury. Marissa, Sarah, whenever you're ready. Hi, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and board members. Can you see and hear me okay? We can hear you fine. And now I see you as well. Yes. Great. So my name is Marissa Melamed. I'm the Healthcare Policy Associate Director at the Green Mountain Care Board um, and uh, the Administrator of the ACO Oversight Program. I'm joined in my remarks by Sarah Tewksbury, Health Policy Analyst. Um, I'm going to walk you through the guidance today and Sarah is going to review the certification slides. We also have the rest of the ACO Oversight team on the line in case they can help answer questions or provide any additional detail on areas that they worked with. Um, this is definitely a team effort across Green Mountain Care Board teams, including health systems finance, uh, policy, data, and analytics. Um, and my job is to bring it all together for you. So I'm going to go ahead and share the slides. Okay. 
Just a minute. Just let me know that you can see it. Sometimes there's a little bit of a delay. Yep, we can see it now, Marissa. Great. So here's the agenda for you today. Pretty standard background, our authority. Uh, we'll go through the 2022 certification eligibility form and the 2022 budget guidance next steps and have an opportunity for board comments and public comment. So the ACO team last spoke with you on May 12th to debrief the FY21 ACO process and to set priorities for 22. Um, you discussed at that time with our consultant, Michael Baylett, on core competencies of high-performing ACOs so that we could consider how his national research and recommendations might inform our process. Um, since I last spoke with you then, we have reviewed the draft guidance with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate um, and One Care Vermont um, and incorporated feedback in some areas, which I will note for you. Um, from this work, the year's guidance is framed with the priorities, goals, and considerations that you see on this slide, um, and that is um, overall um, to um, collect information on ACO financial and quality performance, have our analysis and decisions be data-driven, um, improve our regulatory alignment across Green Mountain Care Board processes, um, and move towards standard reporting and templates with metrics and definitions. Um, as much as possible. But also the continued goals and considerations um, that we've been working with since last year um, that you see below. The one that I want to just sort of call out for you is um, number four, um, timing of information requests. So the guidance that we're reviewing today is the um, budget guidance, and we're trying to make it focused on the building blocks of the FY22 budget. Um, we have been working on an ongoing monitoring plan and reporting manual to collect information um, to help us monitor the um, performance against the budget. And that's um, some things have been pulled out and put into that manual. So I'm going to try to make that clear for you as well what, what goes where. Our statutory authority, you've seen this slide many times before. Um, there are two processes outlined in 18 BSA 9382. Certification um, is uh, one time, and then with ongoing eligibility, that, that form has become fairly standardized over the past couple of years um, with necessary um, updates that we verify each year. The ACO budget is the annual review of the ACO's finances and programs. Um, and the standards and requirements by which we review the submission are in um, the statute and the rule, and um, there are requirements in the all-payer ACO model agreement. Um, the other thing I'll note is that the coming budget year is 22, which is the last year of the current agreement, and so um, we have sort of chunked things 2018 to 2022 um, where appropriate because um, we're now Sort of collecting information on a full five years as it's available. And to orient you a little bit to the documents that are posted in the workbook, um, the draft materials that I'm reviewing today are posted on the Green Mountain Care Board website under today's meeting materials. Um, that includes the certification form, the budget guidance, the attachments, the appendix workbook, um, the ACO reporting manual that I'll mention is um, coming soon so that people can view that and see specifically what's in it. Um, as well, the slides that I'm going to go through, uh, substantive changes are highlighted, I'm uh, sorry, are underlined so that you can see what's different from last year. We did build this guidance off of last year's template. Um, and in the posted documents, those substantive changes are tracked. I didn't track every little single change like dates, Let's try to keep it as clean as possible. So it's, it should just highlight um, what is, you know, what the material changes are. All right, now to get into it, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Tewksbury if she's ready to talk to you about the certification eligibility verification form for 22. Hi all, this is Sarah Tewksbury. Um, for the record, I'm Sarah Tewksbury with the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, can you hear me all very well? 
Yes. Okay. Just checking before I dive in. Um, so this slide that we're looking at, um, and for those of you on the phone, we are looking at slide number six. This is a slide that the members of the Green Mountain Care Board and the staff have seen used quite a bit in the ACO oversight process, um, but it's just an orientation slide and a reminder for members of the public that we are not certifying uh, One Care Vermont this year. They were certified several years ago. And what we're doing with this certification elig eligibility verification form is just um, ensuring that they're continuing to meet the requirements set forth in Rule 5.0 and the statute. So what you'll see, there are those 10 bullets listed out. Those are the 10 sections in Rule 5.0 that specifically address uh, certification criteria. And these are the 10 areas that we really look at uh, in the certification eligibility verification form and that we ask specific questions of One Care Vermont so that we can ensure that they're meeting those requirements year after year. Um, Marissa, if you could go to the next slide, please. Okay, so then this slide is showing you, and this is slide seven for those of you on the phone. Um, this slide is showing you that for FY22 in the form, there have been uh, just a few material changes that we've made since last year. And I do want to note that last year when we presented the FY21 budget guidance to you, there were no material changes. So these are some of the first changes um, in two cycles, really, of budget guidance and certification eligibility verification that we've really made. Um, so for the FY22 form, those changes include that we are asking a question about uh, One Cares 501c3 status. Uh, we determined that this particular uh, change from One Care or for, for One Care becoming a nonprofit uh, falls under the certification requirements. So we've asked a question about that. We've also included One Care's executive compensation uh, information in the certification form this year. And uh, those of you will, who are, you know, uh, come to the Green Mountain Care Board meetings often from members of the public will remember that uh, our lawyer. Rust McCracken did a presentation a few weeks ago about that, um, and you can find some information on the board website about the executive compensation guidance as well. We added updated language on questions about mental health access, pay parity, and addressing uh, adverse childhood events. Um, there's nothing incredibly substantive and um, like large material change. As it says, it's updated language, um, and that's really where we left it. Something that's a uh, improvement in my mind, and I found really helpful doing this exercise, was that we also added citations at the end of every question in the eligibility verification form, so that One Care, the Green Mountain Care Board, anybody who's using and looking at the form can tie the specific question directly back to the section of Rule 5.0, uh, where that question and that requirement falls. Um, so that will be really helpful in both review and I think for members of the board looking back if they're interested in seeing really why we're uh, asking that question. A few ad, uh, administrative things. The form will be posted on the Green Mountain Care Board's website when we issue the budget guidance on July 1st. The form will be completed and submitted by One Care on or before September 1st of this year. And that's really all that I have for certification. Uh, I'll hand it back to Marissa unless we plan to do questions on certification now or at the end. I think of we're going to hold questions till the end and then uh, open Perfect. it up. Great. Yeah, then I'll hand it back to Marissa. Be... Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, that makes sense because there's some overlap between certification and budget. So you can hear the whole package and then um, let us know what questions you have. So to orient you, this is the table of contents for the budget guidance. The, the parts and the sections are the same as they were last year. The timeline for the submission is that we issue the guidance, both the form and the budget by July 1. Uh, the certification application information is due by September uh, first, so that we get a month um, jump on that. It also often provides some helpful background um, as we go into the budget review. The budget submission is due October 1. 
Um, the ACO budget hearing is scheduled for November 10th this year. That's a couple weeks later than it has been in the past to give us more time for review and analysis. Um, also in November, we hear from the ACO and payers on their 2020 quality and financial performance. And um, we present our analysis and recommendations on December 8th um, so that we can vote by the end of the year, tentatively scheduled for December 22nd, which is in line with previous years. We issue a budget order um, usually by the end of January or early February. And then as you heard uh, a couple weeks ago in the spring, um, hopefully we can stick with that end of May timeline that we had this year. One Care comes back with a revised budget, um, which is a new standard process that we've implemented um, so that we can get updated numbers based on their final contracts and attribution. Because as we all know, their budget is built on um, uh, assumptions that they have um, at that time, but their contracts are not tend to be finalized by the the public payers are usually the end of the year, and um, the commercial has been into the into the next year. All right, so now to dive in um, section by section. So the introduction um, summarizes the purpose of the document, the statutory authority, verifications under oath, participation of the healthcare advocate, and requirements for requesting confidentiality. There are no changes to this introduction. We did update the language around COVID-19, which was, of course, a new um, addition last year. Um, and what I will draw your attention to here is that last year we waived certain questions that might not have been relevant under the circumstances or were maybe um, made to reduce some burden. Um, but this year, um, you know, after discussion, um, we have reviewed those questions, incorporated the relevant questions. Um, we no longer saw a need to waive any questions and expected a year into the public health emergency that um, one care who does not provide direct um, service to patients has you know, been able to update their or, or you know, uh, adjust their operations to the new normal and answer um, the full scope of questions that we have. Um, so just to give you an example of questions, um, um, in Section 8, we had some questions about the all-pair model goals that were uh, waived last year. We've reincorporated those. Um, in Sections 4 and 7, um, we asked um, some HSA-specific questions, which we removed because they're no longer relevant um, based on their uh, risk model, which does not use HSA targets anymore. So really, we just removed questions that weren't relevant and kept um, anything that was. Section one on ACO information and background. This is the executive summary for the budget narrative. Um, again, we want the budget narrative to be focused on budget assumptions and limitations. So we just added some clarifying language um, uh, to number five there, key assumptions and limitations. We added a question about lessons learned from the public health emergency um, one year in. And then we added back in um, attachments A and B, which were visuals that one cares provide to us in the past on the ACO network and ACO hospital participation grid um, that we waived last year just um, to you know, ease some of the reporting. Um, and we, again, we have broken out some reporting requirements into a reporting manual. So, um, you know, in this section um, or anywhere in the budget, one care can refer to those reporting requirements if they're relevant, um, but, you know, not, not directly in, in the um, guidance here. Um, and we are also looking for one care to cite the evidence base or data relied on where relevant. Section two is the provider network section. There are three areas in this section, the network development strategy, um, network data that's collected, and the provider contracts. So what's new here? Um, is so one um, in reporting, One Care does submit their network development strategy um, for the coming year in the, the current year. So they submitted their 2022 network development strategy just recently in May um, because they're working on that now to develop their network um, by um, expected September and October. So I updated this language just a little bit to acknowledge that um, and have them sort of give us an update to 
what they said um, in May and now where are they in that network development strategy when it comes time for the budget submission. Um, and this should include uh, anticipated changes to the provider network areas of growth and decline. And we ask them to quantify that um, general observations of drivers leading to participation decisions and uh, challenges and opportunities with their network recruitment. The network data collection is an area where we had um, some good collaboration with OneCare and made some um, helpful updates to the templates. So there are two templates in this section. Um, they are 2.1, the organization list, and then the provider list. Uh, the Green Mountain Care Board and OneCare collaborated on a data dictionary to better describe the variables and the contents of information in both the contracted entity network and the individual provider list. Um, One Care updated the payment type fields to represent the method of payment for the contracts um, and clarify those. So uh, these are now standardized to include fee for service, fee for service reconciled, fixed perspective payments unreconciled, um, AIPBP, which is Medicare only all inclusive population based payment. Um, this also has a, um, an indicator for participation in the comprehensive. Um, payment reform program, and then an NA to represent if um, an entity is not participating with the payer. Um, and there's more work to be done. Um, this is a collaboration between our analytics team and our ACO team and OneCare to improve this provider network data collection. Um, and so we think this represents um, an improvement to help make this data more um, usable. And the a GMCB analytics team is continuing to work on, on developing this list. All right. Next up is section three, the payer program section. Again, this is pretty standard, um, not huge changes here. We collect the scale target initiatives and um, program alignment forms so that we can um, provide um, analysis uh, with the contracts against the requirements um, for qualifying for qualifying for scale and alignment of quality measures. Um, we ask them to explain changes across their portfolio of payer programs, uh, new or terminating programs, changes to existing programs and um, explain if they're not scale target qualifying. We also have questions specifically about expansion of fixed perspective payment, um, true capitation or otherwise, and how those fixed perspective payments are calculated for each program. Um, something that we updated here is the next underlying bullet points, which is just, uh, we've always sort of written this, it was an assumption that maybe the contracts will be finalized, but it, we know that that doesn't work with the timing of their business processes. So we've updated this language um, just to recognize that the payer contracts um, are likely not finalized by the budget submission so that the, so the narrative and the data should be as complete as possible um, given the information that they have and um, that contracts must be submitted within 10 days of execution um, and that the Green Mountain Care Board may request an update on the status of contract negotiation at any time. Um, often or this is um, uh, confidential, so it's done as um, as needed, but it is um, a way that the board can request more information on those contracts if needed um, through executive session. And then there is a there's a question that's been in here for the past couple of years about the expanded Medicaid population, um, which may be more appropriate to move to reporting. Um, it's still in here because we wanted to include this question um, from the HCA, which is what are the lessons learned from the expanded Medicaid population that could be applied to the commercial payer program? All right, section four. Um, we did a lot of work on this section in collaboration with OneCare and to more accurately collect data from them um, in alignment with their risk model. We were able to update templates 4.1 and 4.2 and eliminate um, templates 4.4 and 4.5 because the data was either incorporated into the revised templates or is no longer relevant to the risk model. So I'm going to talk you through those changes um, as, as clearly as um, 
as I can. So the new template uh, 4.1 is total cost of care, performance by payer, total ACO wide. Um, and we do have 2018 to 2022, though we recognize that data will not be available for all of those years. Um, this template represents one care's arrangements with payers. Uh, total cost of care targets are set by payer program and then settled at the close of the year. And as you know, there's a lag in settlement um, of about close to a year. The financial results from the prior year are presented in November, as I showed you on the timeline. Um, the updated template number two, uh, 4.2, is settlement by payer by HSA. Um, so this then takes the total um, uh, settlement by payer and shows you, um, according to the risk model, how it is distributed by HSA. So this represents one care's attribution and settlement um, by HSA or risk bearing entity. Um, 2018 to 2019 are based on um, HSA targets, but then as we heard in 2020 and 2021, um, that model was changed to uh, an ACOI targets, which are then prorated by attribution. So these new templates capture the data um, in this way. And I think a good improvement here is that it shows as much data as we have year over year, 18 to 22. So you can see it in one template as opposed to having to compare across templates the way it was set up before. So the objectives here are to report total cost of care targets by settlement um, by payer in 4.1 and to report settlement by HSA in 4.2, and then what we are calling the HSA accountability strategy in the narrative, which I'm going to show you in a minute with the questions. Um, also, to we want to provide actuals where available and projections if not, so we asked one care to note um, that, and expected total cost of care for the budget year. And then we want them to discuss assumptions for projections and budget and adjustments for settlement. And like I said, we want to collect data as available um, 2018 through 2022. So just to go into the narrative, so you see how we updated the question based on these new templates. Um, the 4.1, which is total cost of care performance by payer, total ACO wide, we asked them to explain the drivers of expected versus actual total cost of care results by payer program to provide actuals for prior year. Um, if actuals are not available, to provide projections and the timeline for when actuals will be available, to provide projections for the current year and for the budget year to provide expected total cost of care, um, what is expected that you're building your budget off of, um, and to recognize any relevant assumptions for projections and budget figures, for example, based on historical seasonal spend plus a particular rate of growth, et cetera, and to describe any adjustment factors used for calculating the settlement result. Then on the second template, which is settlement by payer um, by HSA, um, we ask them to explain the methodology by which the ACO distributed funds by HSA, including all adjustment factors used for calculating the settlement distribution, for example, risk mitigation, market, any market factor adjustments, adjustments for local performance, uh, case mix, et cetera and to discuss the ACO's total cost of care accountability strategy at the HSA level. So we break that out into three parts. Um, how is the ACO using total cost of care data at the local HSA level to identify high value and low value care? Uh, how is the ACO helping hospitals and other community providers to reduce low value care and lower their total cost of care at the local HSA level? And what evidence do you have that the ACO local accountability strategy is working? Um, so this, these updates are to help us um, recognize that One Care um, has moved to a risk model that shifts local accountability. Um, and uh, if if the um, settlement is divided out proportional to attribution, then how are they um, uh, adjusting for performance by HSA? Um, we have t uh, discussed these um, templates um, with One Care. Uh, we understand that they're looking at measures for HSA account uh, for accountability, um, and so at the, at the at this time we don't have a sort of data collection template here. We we put the question into a narrative, um, and also I will note that um, some of these updates, you know, there's much discussion during the Michael Bailet presentation around 
um, one of his points, which was systematic evaluation of opportunities to reduce low value, affordable and unsafe care um, to inform changes in, in care delivery. And this is how we incorporated that um, topic into the guidance. All right, so then there's another template 4.3, which is projected and budgeted trend rates by payer program. There's no change to this template. Um, the objective of this template is to discuss the underlying assumptions for the trend rates, to discuss the budgeted growth rate versus the ACO growth rate over time, um, excuse me, to discuss the approach to calculating base experience. And we also added in here, may, um, it may be repetitive, but again, this note about um, you know, in references to this template, how the ACO's total cost of care accountability strategy allows providers to benefit from their ability to provide high, high value care and impact total cost of care growth. Just to um, make it clear, this is uh, an important question to us. <clears throat> These are the two templates that we propose removing total cost of care, budget, year targets, by payer by HSA. The rationale for this one is that this one is that 4.4 was the budget year and the, all the years are now incorporated into 4.1 and 4.2. So it's no longer needed. Um, 4.5 um, is uh, a template that reflects uh, data collection on home hospital spend versus spend at UVMMC or Dartmouth or other hospitals and was created for the outdated risk model where total cost of care targets were set by HSA. Um, I want to emphasize here that we're with removing these. We're not trying to remove any reporting requirements. Um, we're trying to collect, um, well, not have things that are duplicative and um, make sure that the data we're collecting is relevant. Um, we may want to um, think about 4.5 and what the objectives were there um, to see if there's another way we can collect data around um, spending in and out of the home hospital. Um, given some of the information you've heard about um, uh, patient migration and such, but I, I do not have a proposal for you on that at this time. Section five on risk management. Um, there are no changes. Um, we feel as though these templates collect the um, risk arrangements by payer um, and risk bearing entity um, well. So we're not proposing any changes these templates. They show ACL risk by payer um, and payer specific risk mitigation strategies, risk by payer and risk bearing entity, um, i.e. the hospitals and any specific risk mitigation strategies, and then a summary of shared savings and losses. And, and some of this information does tie to what's in section four. Section six is um, uh, the ACO budget section. So this is where we collect uh, the financial data. Um, it includes projected and budgeted financial statements, um, an income statement with accountability, which I am going to talk about um, on the next slide, variance analysis, budgeted sources and uses documentation, per member per month revenues by payer, details of hospital participation and risk, um, management, compensation, and population health management uh, expense breakout numbers. Um, the budget narrative includes an explanation of significant variations over prior year. Um, and we are basing that off of the revised budget, which you heard at the end of May and um, we're reviewing now. And then any expected gains, losses, their rationale, or to the extent applicable, how one care intends to balance to break even budget, surplus to reserves, et cetera. We added a question here, which is underlined, or maybe it's just a sub question, um, to discuss any prior or current year surplus or losses and their intended use and how they were earned. How does nonprofit status, status affect treatment of reserves? So this question um, sort of links to the certification question about um, their new nonprofit status. Um, just a, an overview of the financial template, um, which you'll see posted are in their own workbook. Um, we may keep it that way since there are so many of them um, instead of being in the master, but there are a few little adjustments that we need to make before um, their formatting adjustments and, and um, uh, formulas that are in the forms before we, we can call these final, but they are substantively um, 
correct on the on the website now in in the workbook. Um, these are the templates that are included. The balance sheet. Um, I didn't know here, but we did make some updates to the uh, to the account lines. Um, the income statement and with accountability. Um, we did a lot of work on that with um, One Care this year, and uh, we're pretty happy with the result. I think it um, presents the picture of how their business operations work um, more clearly. Um, this, the income statement with accountability includes um, expected total cost of care target components that are processed externally to One Care, which includes fee for service claims components, surcharges, et cetera. Um, they're broken out by payer program um, and total cost of care accountability target. So this more, this new income statement more clearly shows you their full accountability budget, including dollars that are that never flow through One Care. Um, and then what dollars do flow through One Care, um, and we think that that will um, be clear to the public and also for accountants. Um, it more clearly ties to a um, to a standard income statement, or what an accountant would expect to see as a standard income statement, without including all, all these dollars that don't actually flow through um, the organization. And that went through quite a bit of. Uh, process work with um, our finance team and uh, one care finance team to improve that template. Um, there's no changes to cash flow. The variance analysis um, is a detailed variance analysis that we added into the guidance last year. It was in the question and answer process. Um, so it seemed to make sense to just put that in up front. Um, sources and uses. Uh, it really helps to us to understand um, where the dollars come from and where they go. Um, this was updated to clarify and define the the fields, um, and so I think that it's a lot more clear um, this year. Uh, Six point five per member per month revenues by payer. It's no change. Um, the hospital participation tab is under review. Um, Though, as it stands, I, I think we can include it um, as it is. Um, we've been working with health systems finance team um, as well as um, conversations with um, hospitals to clarify or, or to align um, how this information is collected on the hospital budget side and the ACO side. Um, so at, there are no proposed changes um, currently, but we recognize that there are there's some ways that we could improve this, improve this data collection, um, so that we can um, align and understand how the ACO look um, may be different than than the look you get from hospitals. Um, six seven is ACO management compensation um, information. There also, as Sarah Tewksbury said, um, the updated guidance um, on the uh, interpretive guidance on executive compensation um, tied to quality is in certification, but this template is simply collecting the um, salaries. And then we've updated the population health management expense breakout. That covers the changes in section six. Section seven, quality population health model of care and community integration initiatives has these key areas, model care, clinical focus areas, quality improvement, population health and payment reform, care coordination and care navigator, integration of social services, um, childhood adversity and all payer model quality and population health goals. In reviewing the um, criteria for these sections and, and why they're each in here, um, we know that the childhood adversity question is specific to a certification requirement, so we moved that to certification form. Um, that's the major change here. And then, as I said at the beginning, there were some all-pair model quality and population health goals questions that were waived last year that we have reinstated. And the narrative should include, across these areas, progress to date, including HSA level statistics where appropriate, um, methods, metrics, and measuring. Um, impact um, to help us evaluate all these areas and the proposed budget year objectives. 
This slide summarizes the data that we collect um, in this section. Um, I added this slide because um, I think another thing that I pulled from, that I heard from the conversation with Michael Bailet is that this section is really um, the hardest one for us to evaluate. Um, and, you know, he made the recommendation that, you know, can we pull in subject matter experts that work on these type of programs? Um, and, you know, we can think about that, but we um, do now collect data and review it and um, need to understand the scope of what we can collect and, um, and our evaluation of it. So I wanted to summarize the data that we currently ask for in the guidance. Um, and that includes clinical focus area results as available, um, variation in information on variation in care, which in utilization measures um, by HSA, as well as um, variations in outcomes um, measures by HSA, and the five most prevalent chronic conditions and the five most prevalent high class conditions, which they broke, uh, one care has broken out by payer in prior submissions. We also asked them for data on population risk stratification and spend since uh, that is how their care model, um, that's what their care model is based on. And we asked them for statistics on care navigator and care coordination. So we've made a couple of um, minor tweaks to questions. The model of care question has been updated to read what elements of the care model has one care eliminated or not adopted because they were not successful, what elements have been scaled up, and where would one care like to put more resources, what is the data behind these decisions. Um, we asked this question more directly because it seemed to come up in discussions um, that board members want to understand um, what programs are being scaled, what programs are or maybe tested but are not, um, they're not going forward with. And um, you know where would where could more resources go if they were available, um, and and why? What is the data? How are these decisions made? Clinical focus area question uh, again. Um, I think quality and clinical focus areas were sort of mushed together in a previous guidance. We we broke them out and updated this question to read um, that one care should report any results on 2020 clinical focus areas, note um, interim if, if they're available, and progress to date on 2021 clinical focus areas using the Appendix 7.1 provided. Um, and they should provide a narrative description of the ACO's implementation strategy for its clinical focus areas in the current year and in planning for the budget year. And how does the ACO support providers in achieving the goals of the clinical focus area? How are results shared with providers at the HSA and or the organization level? Um, and does the ACO prepare, prepare any final reporting um, on, on these areas? Section eight, uh, there's no change to this section. This section was not required last year, as I said. Um, the third question was in section seven, but we moved it to section Eight, um, and that question reads, all pair model quality and population health goals, please complete Appendix 8.1, which is ACO activities related to the Vermont all pair ACO model agreement, population health and quality goals, and describe results to date and explain your strategies for assisting the state to achieve its quality and population health goals as specified in the all pair model. Um, in doing so, please also discuss the expected impact of COVID-19 on 2021 performance, sharing any early indicators or relevant insights. Um, what we did remove from this question was um, part of the question asked about um, ranking HSAs um, against their targets, and we took that out because there are no longer HSA level targets. But instead, we are asking for, well, not instead, we, we are still asking for the HSA um, variation information in other areas to cover that. Okay, so that is all part one, the reporting requirements in those sections. Um, part two is the um, ACO budget target. Um, this table is provided as a guide and a reference for discussing template 4.3 projected and budgeted trend rates by payer program. So in deciding whether to improve or modify an ACO's proposed budget, the board 
um, will take into consideration the requirements of the all-payer model, including the all-payer total cost of care per beneficiary growth target, the Medicare total cost of care per beneficiary growth target, the ACO um, scale targets, and the statewide health outcomes and quality of care targets um, per the rule. These um, uh, projections or trends are updated um, yearly, and, and we provide that as a reference. Um, and Sarah Lindbergh will talk about that in more detail um, when it comes to that. Um, in so the budget targets, um, the board generally sets ACO budget targets um, and benchmarks during the budget submission um, process after taking into account the ACO's proposed budget. Um, so this is, is you'll hear about this separately. Um, the board may establish guidelines for managing certain portions of the ACO's budget. Um, for example, admin expense ratio, population health ratio. Um, that's what I mean when I said the financial templates were being updated. We have to make sure those formulas and calculations are in there. Just a technical detail. Section three or part three, uh, sorry, of the guidance is uh, guidance around the revised budget process. Um, we're putting in here due May uh, 2022 um, or spring TBD. Um, it was presented by the end of May this year, um, but it can be set at the discretion of the board upon execution of the payer contracts. We keep in close contact with one care about that. Um, it includes all of these elements, um, one through eight there are, there are no changes. Um, there are two parts that were in last year's guidance that I moved to reporting. Um, that is the details of expansion of fixed perspective payments across payer programs, um, including payment calculation methodologies and ado adoption rates by providers and actuarial opinion. Um, and the reason is that those are specific budget order requirements that we do want them to hear about, um, or that, sorry, that we do want them to report on, um, but they're specifically moved to our reporting manual. Um, to get that information as opposed to the revised budget um, elements above are sort of the standard budget order elements and, and number nine are reporting requirements. Um, let's see. All right, so a note about the monitoring plan. So the ACO reporting manual outlines standard reporting and other deliverables to be provided by the ACO to the GMCB along with the deadlines for their submission. Over the years that we've been reviewing the budget, we have um, found that there are standard reports that we want to collect um, year over year. The network development strategy, clinical focus areas, um, reporting on the comprehensive payment reform program, just for some examples off the top of my head. Um, instead of putting those in the guidance every year, um, we have created a separate manual where we're standardizing those reporting templates um, establishing uh, deadlines for reporting throughout the year. And this is will enable the Green Mountain Care Board to monitor performance against the budget and should allow us to keep reporting requirements in reporting and the budget um, in the budget. Um, I, we are working to get that um, available for people to review what is in there um, so that you can see, okay, if it's not in the guidance, it's here and when we're gonna get it. Um, and um, staff, um, when we're not actively reviewing the budget, um, are working on compiling um, and summarizing the reporting that comes throughout the year so that board members can use that, can review that information um, in conjunction with their review of the budget. All right, so that brings me through the walkthrough. Again, just a reminder of the next steps. Um, uh, as Susan mentioned at the beginning, um, after a discussion today, there will be a public comment period. We ask that written comments are submitted by uh, June 16th so that we have time to review and incorporate those for our potential vote on the 23rd. And that brings me to the end of the slides. I'm happy to take questions. So thank you so much, Marissa and Sarah. And, and Marissa, I want to uh, compliment you on uh, taking to heart, um, really trying to streamline where possible, but without um, um, removing any 
information that's so essential as we uh, monitor this program. So uh, thank you for that. And I, I know that no regulated entity will ever believe anything is, is streamlined unless it was a simple form with one line and that one line was our, our stamp of approval. Um, but with that being said, I think you have tried to, um, you know, jettison things that uh, aren't necessary. And um, I really appreciate that work. And with that, I'll open it up to the board for questions or comments. I just Robin? have one question, uh, Marissa. Great job. Uh, very thorough and very clear presentation. Um, do you have a sense of when the reporting manual might be ready for folks? I'm just uh, thinking that might be a question that comes up in public comment. Yeah, um, I was hoping to have it for now, but um, we're not quite there. I think that it's important for us to be able to post it um, for the vote, or at the very least, um, we have a uh, table of contents which shows, uh, which is very detailed and shows um, each report that's in there. Um, the statutory reference, the reason for the report, a uh, plain language, um, uh, like sort of purpose of what the report is. Um, and so I, I feel confident we can get that posted. Um, the reason for the delay is that each template um, is gets reviewed with one care, um, and some of them are sort of in, in draft form, and I don't want to be confusing by updating those constantly. So we're trying to update them um, in the order that they're due. But I think that if we can get that um, that table of contents up there, then people will be able to see, and that will that will be a huge help. So so that you can see it in time for the uh, vote. Thanks. Makes sense. Okay. Other comments or questions from the board? I have one. Um, <clears throat> Go ahead, Tom. The uh, so I I haven't sent out the. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, draft of the ACO strategic plan. And, you know, I, I, I was looking at it for in terms of specifics having to do with their their cost reduction. They say in the introduction letter that the ACO says turning the tide from an unsustainable model with health care spending on the rise and quality of care stymied to a model that reduces health care costs. And then later on, their other uh, reference to cost is short term, which is good. Recommendation number 10 from the all payer model implementation plan, identify cost growth drivers. That's the narrative. And so I kind of jumped from that um, in the interim, having listened to Michael Baylett, who was saying that reducing costs is one of the you know, top strategic um, um, goals or or you know of, of a high, of a high performing aco to just the example here on page 12 of the slides where we're talking about provider contracts payment strategies and methodologies and their contribution to goals of reducing costs and i i guess i'm unclear as to where in these guidelines we are asking the aco to clearly set forth their goals for reducing costs in some kind of a metric other than a narrative phrase. I mean, I'm, I'm happy with the way things are turning in terms of FPP and that that these guidelines have been amended a bit to kind of circle around um, uh, um, a, 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 a a, a definition of of what percent of F, FPP is quote unquote the tipping point. That's a good thing, but I, I don't I, I I I don't know where to look to say here is where we are on a cost frontier. Here is the ACO's hoped for impact on that cost, and that as we go down the road, we can see the progress going forward. Well, I think that it um, that you're right that it is in that section. Um, and I guess if you have specific measures in mind um, that you think that we should add, we can look at that. Um, but I, I think you're right that it's captured in the narrative um, because um, beyond those targets, um, 
we're not collecting data on specific measures. So um, I think we're hoping through some of the narrative or continued discussions to um, perhaps be able to hone in on what um, that data could be. And then, as you know, on the um, target and strategy for increasing fixed perspective payments, um, the uh, ACO is expected to report on that budget order condition next month. Um, and we have questions in the guidance um, on that going forward as well. Well, that, I mean, that's a good thing because we will have that in time to uh, have that as a, as a, um, a, a, a point uh, relative to um, our rate reviews and our hospital budget process. But um, in terms of cost, I, I, I don't know where to look to figure out what it is we should hold the ACA, ACO to. Um, there's no starting metric and no ending metric. And um, I, I, you know, um, I think the kind of progress that we're making in terms of defining FPP, hopefully we can make some progress in terms of, of wh what they mean by goals of reducing cost. So I'll just speak for myself in reaction, if that's OK, Kevin. Go ahead, Robin. Yeah, so where I, I where, what I look to for that is two things. I look at um, the all pair model uh, cost target goals for trend. Um, and then I look at the benchmarks that are set annually for the ACO. And I and then what we get for information in terms of their performance in quality and cost. So to me, I think the most relevant data in terms of the financial data is in those benchmarks because having that is that is the cost goal is the benchmark. Um, the other place that I think about that is in terms of the evidence that they had presented in prior budgets for their care model and whether their care model is achieving the goals. So it's not a financial metric, but the, the purpose behind the care model is to bend that cost curve. So um, I don't know if that's helpful um, for your thinking, Tom, but I just thought I would share that in terms of how I look at it. Yeah, yeah. other questions or comments from the board? Yeah, I have a couple. Um, and Marissa, uh, um, they're actually relevant to the actual guidance, the budget guidance. So I'm wondering if you might be able to pull that up so I can be more specific. Sure thing. Hang on just a sec. OK, you can let Perfect. me know what. Section yeah. Looking at. Um, so actually, I wanted to look at section two um, under question number three. If that's possible. And I want to preface this all with um, without having seen the new reporting manual, some of my questions or comments may be better suited for the reporting manual. But as I was reading this, I was thinking there's information that I would like um, to have prior to the budget process you know so if it's coming through the reporting manual great just let me know that um, okay. uh, so in um, section in question three if you look at B uh, B is talking mostly about you know a description of new or expanded ACO incentives to strengthen primary care including strategies for recruiting primary care providers providing resources to expand capacity and then it goes on to say, and reducing the administrative burden of re reporting requirements per providers, et cetera, et cetera. That feels to me like that session, that section on reducing the administrative burden of reporting requirements for providers is relevant not only to primary care practices and primary care providers, but to all providers that are participating. So I, one suggestion would be to, yeah, cut that and make it, make it C. Um, and that way it, it's clear that we're interested in hearing about reducing administrative burden for all providers, not just primary care providers, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, make a note. Okay, Public great. Edit. And others may weigh in and, and decide if that's, you know, uh, important enough to change or not. Um, I also have two suggested additions to that section three. 
uh, or not section three, part three of section two. Um, it would be, a, if we called it E or now F, um, please quantify the number and type of providers who have dropped out of the network in the past, and I suggested two years, to the best of your knowledge, and to the best of their knowledge, your their reasons for exiting. I really want to understand providers who participated in the network and now no longer participate in the network and why. So something, a question there that will help us understand um, those who have exited and why and how many and what the types of those providers are. And then uh, an additional one right below that, which would be I would like more information about what kinds of provider outreach, formal provider outreach results they have, whether it's coming from surveys or focus groups that evaluate satisfaction uh, that providers have with ACO programs. So I lost, I lost yep, the slide. We, Are I, you there? I, I, okay. Yeah, I'm still here. I've taxed my computer's ability to keep up. Public editing okay. is probably risky, but I'm following you. Okay, great. I just want to understand, you know, how are they assessing, uh, you know, provider satisfaction with the ACO programs? They're evolving all the time. So I really want to understand that somewhere. So again, this may uh, fit more into the reporting manual than into the budget guidance. I don't know, but those are two areas that I'm really interested in learning more about. Um, and I think it relates to network strategy, right? And our scale targets and things like that that we have to meet. Um, and then if you, I guess you can't go to section. Can I Yes, go Can I ahead. Just say on that point, um, so I, those are great suggestions. What I want to do before we incorporate that is review that template in the reporting manual. Um, like you said, it would be really helpful for you to be able to see that um, because if those elements are included and that is, um, you know, that satisfies um, what you're looking for, then it may actually be covered already. So I will review that and let you know before the vote. Um, Great. I definitely do not want to duplicate. So, yeah, yep. no interest exactly. in duplicating any work. Just want to make sure it's somewhere between the two sections or the two uh, documents. Um, and then section four. Actually, since uh, it's hard for you to pull that up, but you could either. Well, I can just tell you it was on slide 16, um, or it's in section four, and it's those new questions that have been added under uh, subsection two. Um, okay, I'm going to bring the slides back up because the um, Word document crashed while I was. No worries. To do it's slide 16. Okay, this should work fine. Uh, it just takes a minute. Okay. Okay, great. So uh, under A there, how is the ACO using total cost of care data? I think it might be helpful to add how is the ACO using total cost of care and quality data at the local HSA level to identify high value and low value care since you obviously need cost and quality data to understand high and low value care. So I think that might be a small addition. Um, and then in C, letter C, what evidence do you have that the ACO local accountability strategy is working? Um, I was going to have it be a little more specific. My suggestion, if others like this or not, uh, was to say, please provide evidence by HSA that the local accountability strategy is working. In other words, please supply evidence that steps taken in part A and part B above are effective at eliminating waste and improving health outcomes. So it, it's much more specific uh, it relates to parts A and B, and it's by HSA. So that was my suggested modification for that section. Um, I can go on to my, my final comment, unless you want to res respond to that piece first. I don't, I don't have any comments here. What I'll do is take your suggestions um, and look at them and see if, if anything's captured elsewhere or not, and then when we come back, let you know, and then, um, you know, we can propose um, putting these in, and if everyone, if all board members agree, we can include them in the final. Sure, that sounds great. Um, and then I guess my last suggestion was, and again, this could be in the reporting manual that we haven't seen yet, but it relates to the CPR program. Um, to me, this is, you know, I don't know whether where it fits, but it's a really important pilot in my mind. 
it's really the only way for independent providers to participate in the model um, or one of the only, you know, it's really an important way for the independents to participate. And it's really our opportunity to evaluate how true fixed payment um, is impacting cost, is impacting utilization, is impacting population health. We need more information about this program and how it's rolling out, you know, uh, as it relates to participation rates of independent providers, as it relates to total cost of care, how has that been affected by changing, you know, independent providers payments to a capitation model? How has it affected health outcomes? We have several years now in the program. So how, how do we, where are we going to see or ask about um, the assessment of this in a really concrete way? So we can better understand whether it's working, how it's working, um, you know, provider buy-in, impact on cost, impact on quality. So again, I'll, if it's in the reporting manual, great. If it's not, could it fit in here? Yeah, this is a great point. Um, and I think that um, this is uh, an area that we have the, um, the ACL report on through the year. So over the past couple of years, we have had them do interim and final reporting in July and January. Um, at this point, um, it may annually may be appropriate. Um, we do not have a standard reporting template for that. And this template is actually like next up on the docket for um, development into, um, you know, here's the standard template that we want one care to report um, every year on this program so that we can understand um, and evaluate this program over time now that it's well established and, and an example of a program that's growing. Um, so the reason why you don't see it in the guidance is because I do view it as um, a reporting requirement, one that still needs standard reporting. Um, so we can, if, if that is a concern, um, we can show you what we what we have or what we propose to do, and you can decide if that um, is sufficient and you're comfortable with that, or if you want to add something in the um, something into the guidance um, on that program. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Those are my comments, suggestions, questions. Thank you, Jess. Other members of the board? So I just had um, a question about one of Jess's suggestion, which was the evidence by HSA that the accountability strategy is working, because I believe um, 2020 might have been the first year of that strategy or 2021. Now I've I've lost whether it was started this year. When? 20, yeah. So we won't have the 2020 results until when, Marissa? Oh, let me see if I get this right. Um, I guess the end of this year, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that, yeah, there's about a year lag in those results. So I'm just wondering, Jess, if the answer we'll get is we can't give that to you because we're still doing the 2020 results. And so would it be better to have the more theoretical question this year and then shift it to a more results oriented question for the timing of the data? I don't know. I mean, you can think about it. I was just thinking that like, I. I, I agree we want to understand that, but the data lag issue may be a problem for getting that by October is what I was wondering about. Yeah, I mean, I guess I wonder if there could be an answer to that question that relates to, for example, their former risk distribution model where it was actually local HSA accountability. I mean, are there lessons that they've learned about how, um, strategies that they've pursued at the local level that have improved, you know, cost and quality and what evidence to, is there about that. So maybe we can tweak the language a bit, but certainly there has been a look at the HSA level for the past several years and there's data on cost, there's data on quality, you know, what strategies are working and what's the evidence about it. So I, I guess let's maybe we can circle back to a better uh, question here, but I don't want to lose. Um, I don't want to lose a look at the HSA level about what's working and what's not. So how do we incorporate that? Yeah, no, I think that makes sense to me. I just wanted to make sure that we're asking the question in the way that we get 
the information that we want. Um, and I think one of the, my recollection, which may be faulty from the previous risk model is the explanation for moving away from it was because of the small ends in some of the HSAs, the data wasn't meaningful. So I think trying to figure out what the right question is so we can get that um, is important. So sounds good. I, yeah. I agree with the spirit of your of your thought. OK, other questions oh. or comments from the board? Oh, I'm sorry, Marissa, did I cut you off? Well, I, I can make one response to that, I think, in that the way the new template is, it we have we're collecting information back to 18. We, we decided we could sort of chunk it all together. So you can see um, the settlement for 1819, um, which was the, the old risk model. And then we have 20, um, 2021 and 22, uh, which, you know, the data lag is, issue is always an issue. But I think presenting all of it there, whether we have full data or not, then, then in the narrative, perhaps they can refer to, well, here is what was going on in 1819. Here's what we think for 20. Um, here's what we're thinking about or projecting for 2021, 20, 2022. So I'd, I'd like to hope that in presenting it in that way, like that um, it will allow um, one care to sort of discuss that. And then um, I also ask for um, timelines for when data is expected to be final because it is, it's challenging to keep track of that and know where to ask for it and when. OK, other questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, I'm going to open it up to public comment. Does any member of the public wish to comment on the presentation today about the proposed guidance for fiscal year 22 ACO budget uh, submissions? Well, I'm not seeing any hands raised, but I'll just remind everyone that we do have an open public comment period that the um, full language data of the uh, guidance along with the templates will be posted to our website so that you'll be able to um, walk through those um, more carefully. And um, again, I want to thank um, Marissa and Sarah um, for the hard work on this. And um, with that, uh, We'll finish this uh, segment of the agenda. Is there any old business to come before the board? And I would ask if Mike Fisher is on the call. Um, Mike, are you on? So Kevin, this is Eric. Um, I think Mike is finishing working on a RFP with uh, for our, our funding, so I don't think he's here this afternoon. Okay, I was just going to find out if he had um, feedback at the last meeting. I had asked people to either reach out to myself or him on the uh, proposal, and uh, um, I didn't hear of uh, from anybody that wished to volunteer, and I was just curious if Mike could give us update on his end of what he heard. So um, he's only does, heard from more. Uh, so far, uh, Chair Mullen, and so I don't know whether uh, perhaps the waiting for people to contact or perhaps a, a new mode of uh, outreach regarding that issue is warranted, but so far he's only been contacted by more uh, Mark about it. Okay, well, um, let him know that I'll bring it up again at the next meeting um, and uh, uh, you know, we don't want him to think that uh, we've forgotten that he's made a proposal. Will do. Thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. Is there any other old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? To move. Second. Second. It's been moved by Robin and seconded by Jess to adjourn the meeting today. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please say nay. 
Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of the day.